Isn't moonlight gorgeous? It has a calming sort of touch, and anything that gets bathed in its silvery light takes on a melancholic kind of beauty. The intensity of moonlight is just 0.1 lux, which makes it around a million times weaker than the sun. Even if the Earth was as far out as Pluto, the sun would still shine 450 times brighter than the moon. If one was to judge only by the numbers, then it would seem almost impossible that we can see anything in moonlight. But our eyes, being a product of evolution, found a way. They contain two kinds of light-sensitive cells, rods and cones. The rods are sensitive to brightness and are a thousand times more sensitive than the cones, which are sensitive to color. Moonlight is just about strong enough to stimulate the rod cells, but cannot stimulate the cones much. That means we see enough of the brightness, but not as much of the color. And the absence of color makes everything look gray, silvery and mysterious in the full moon. So moonlight is no different than the regular sunlight, just six orders of magnitude weaker. And if you were to put a prism in front of moonlight, it would split into the familiar rainbow. It was 1800 when William Herschel came up with the idea of measuring the temperature of each color. The concept of color having a temperature does sound pretty odd. But since light is just electromagnetic energy of different wavelengths, it turned out to be an important insight. The experiment showed that the temperature increased from blue to red. An interesting find for sure, but that was not all. When Herschel measured the temperature of the region beyond the red band, it turned out to be even higher. This radiation that was invisible to the human eye but had clear heating effect came to be known as the infrared spectrum. Anything that's not close to absolute zero emits a certain amount of infrared radiation, depending on its temperature. When it comes to astronomy, infrared has its advantages. Because of its long wavelength, it is able to pass through dust clouds that scatter visible light. With near-infrared, mid-infrared and far-infrared images, we have been able to look at the universe in an entirely new light. The center of our galaxy, as well as cooler objects like planets and comets, have been illuminated by infrared imaging. The only issue with infrared radiation is that it is absorbed by water vapor. And though you might think that the atmosphere is pretty dry, especially this time of the year, there's quite a few bucketfuls up there. If it all came down at once, it would cover the surface of the planet with a layer one inch thick. Which is why most of the images we showed you earlier were taken from space-based telescopes. But these are inconvenient. Because once they're up in the space, it's really difficult to carry out repair or maintenance. Plus, the sensors required to detect infrared radiation need to be kept at low temperatures to maintain their sensitivity. And once the coolant runs out, so does your luck. You're also limited in how much energy you can provide them, since all you have is solar panels. This makes the missions limited in duration and flexibility, as well as wildly expensive. Budgets being tight, astronomers of the infrared variety had to find a way to conduct their observations cheaper. And so they came up with SOFIA, a mobile observatory that flies at 43,000 feet and is used for infrared astronomy. Flying at this height allows it to bypass most of the water vapor in our atmosphere. Once it gets above the clouds, a hatch on the rear left opens to reveal an infrared telescope. The telescope can look at angles between 20 and 70 degrees and is inertially balanced so the vibrations of the plane don't affect its measurements. The modified Boeing 747SP flies in a designated path with respect to the object that they are observing. While the scientific team on board studies and records the readout from the sensors attached to the other end of the telescope. They have to do this in the night, of course because in daytime, the sun just overpowers everything. But flying through the night, in the silvery moonlight, unlocking the secrets of the universe, not to mention plenty of legroom, must be a hell of a job. While this mobile observatory is designed to look at all the interesting things we spoke about earlier, on one of the flights, the people in charge decided to point it towards the moon. After the signal from the moon was cleaned up and processed, the team found peaks at the 6 micron wavelength. 6 microns being the signature of water. This was somewhat surprising, as the telescope was pointed towards the sunlit portion of the moon, where temperatures can exceed 100 degrees Celsius. And water really had no business being there. The discovery happened near the Clavius crater. And this may lead you to think that maybe the water was in the crater's shadow. 
But in a Reddit AMA, the team definitely clarified that it was in the sunlit region. So the question becomes, how did it form? They're not quite sure yet. But one of the hypotheses is that micrometeorites may be responsible. The sun bombards the lunar surface with hydrogen because 95% of solar wind is hydrogen, which reacts with oxygen species in the ground to form hydroxyl. Then the extreme heat from micrometeorites converts the hydroxyl to water while also melting the lunar regolith. What a cool word, regolith. To form little glass beads that enclose the water. So it's kind of like one of those fossils you find preserved in amber. Just that instead of critters, it's water molecules. And instead of amber, it's moon glass. The glass beads protect the water from floating away into space, since the thin atmosphere of the moon wouldn't be enough to keep them on the surface otherwise. Another question that crossed my mind was, since snakes can see infrared, why didn't we just ask them? So this discovery isn't exactly a bombshell. We have long suspected water in the sunlit regions of the moon. And this was just confirmation of the fact. Several missions, including Chandrayaan-1, found chemical signatures at 3 microns, which was indicative of water, but could have also been hydroxyl. This new observation confirmed that even if there was hydroxyl out there, it is being converted to water at a pretty good rate. Now, I've seen several articles where they talk about this discovery helping to pave the way for a moon base, allowing us to use the water to create hydrogen fuel. But before you fetch your pool party equipment, consider this. The water that they found is not liquid water or ice or even vapor. They are individual molecules of water inside glass beads. At least on the face of it, it does not seem all that accessible. Then there is the amount. The portion of the lunar surface they studied is a hundred times drier than the Sahara Desert. And that's pretty dry. Even experienced moisture farmers would find tough to turn a profit out of this. And there's the fact that the scientists suspect large amounts of ice in the shadowed region of the moon's poles, with estimates going up to 2 billion tons. If there are going to be any large-scale water harvesting operations, they'll be happening at the poles. NASA's Artemis mission aims to put humanity back on the moon by 2024. Before that, there will be several missions sent to scope the place out. Viper will map out all of the moon's water resources. And NASA is paying intuitive machines $50 million to send a drill with a spectrometer to the moon. This will aim to drill for ice beneath the moon's south pole. All in all, this is a very exciting time for space exploration. And I'll be keeping you guys updated on everything as it happens. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Like, share, subscribe and start a conversation below to get more videos like this in your recommendation. I'll see you really soon. Bye.